Welcome to the Stories Are Soul Food podcast, presented by Cannonball Books, the kids' fiction imprint of Cannon Press. Met a ghost of a king on the road when I first fell. Fire burning to my knees, to my knees I fell. Met a ghost of a king on the road. Words just, to, just to start us off easily. Oh, first, we do need to start with a reminder. What's that, our reminder? The reminder of the uh, Look at Moving Pictures Club, the Fablemans. It's now going to be February. You're, the members of our club are supposed to watch. I mean, I, you also have to decide if we're going to call it Lamp or Lamp. It's, I think I think it's uh, a. <laughs> it could be either. Lamp Club. Yes. <laughs> I was displeased to hear that some people have been calling us Sassafras. Sassafras. Um, but you that's know. that's nowhere near as poetic as sass. <laughs> The trailing aspiration. (laughs) (laughs) Sass. Anyways, Fableman's in theaters now. DVD releases. Is it in theater still? I I think think it's on an Amazon app near you. I should say in Idaho theaters now. Weeks after everyone else had it, I think I think we lose. I think we lose it quickly. It's it's different actually for us now. It's like is it? It's more like things very fleetingly come through our theaters. Some people were very upset to see it was only available for like twenty dollar purchase, but the DVD drops. I think on the fourteenth. It's a Valentine's but look, Day. But here's here's the other thing. Available for twenty dollars. Um, should I just be wildly unsympathetic and say, Yeah, I think you should. Grow up. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things that this this is one of the pollutants of Netflix and everything else is the reason why their movies suck is like, because they you don't pay twenty dollars. You don't for pay them. twenty bucks for them. Um, you pay them way more than that in your monthly subscription. You know, they, they've yeah. found a workaround, but it's not tied to the quality of the film. And so a movie like Fableman's that's in theaters, if you were going to go watch it in theaters, you'd get, you'd what, get a babysitter, go buy two movie tickets. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, that, I mean, that's you know, going to be way more than 20 bucks. So if, if you think of it as a date night, if it's, if it's mom and dad, yeah, it's not a big deal. And this is incidentally, I'm preaching to the choir I, and to myself here. This was how I got around it. You know, just like I've, I've said on this program before, if I like a thing, I'll buy an album. I won't just stream it on Apple Music. I won't just stream it on Spotify. I'll, I'll try to support the artist by yeah. actually paying for what I'm using. Um, and a movie like this is, I want more of them. You know, I, I, I want to incentivize more movies like this. And so being willing to pay for a, a quality film the way we used to. So if we had a movie club, and it was not very long ago and all these movies were in theaters and people were saying, well, I'm going to wait till I can rent it. Sure. Great. Yeah. I need to wait till the rental window or that, that makes complete sense. Yeah. But we've gotten so desensitized to the fact that we think we should be able to participate in 50 to $100 million things without paying for any of it. <laughs> like we, we want people to, to expend eight figures in trying to tell a story and then we are not willing to buy a ticket to... To yeah. take a look because we stream stuff for free now. It's free. Um, and that's, I think, one of the biggest downsides of the streaming war is the devaluation of art, both in quality for the artist. They don't invest as much in the streaming content. And then also for the viewer, they they think so little of it because it's just... Isn't that just what musicians, musicians are 15 years further down this road? Yep. And they say the same thing. Yep. Our songs are not worth it now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why, why am I doing this? And we just have to tour. Yeah. And the thing of it, so musicians have to tour to make money because that's the only thing they can control is the live experience. Uh, now, and all their song releases are just marketing for tours. That's it. They're just, you know, marketing the tour. The problem is for filmmakers is that there is no, there's no version of that. You know, there's no live show uh, that they can fall back to. It's just the actual end delivery of their product is now devalued completely. And that um, when people tell me, it's like, man, why are movies so bad these days? Or why are there, aren't there, why are there not very many good movies on Netflix or things like that? It's like, well, it's the nature. It's not the fault of the people. It's the, it's the nature of the alignment and the incentives. And, and I know I could care a great deal I think I've said this on a previous episode. I could care a great deal about my art. And yet if Netflix gave me $20 million to make a movie, then I could make it quickly without reshoots and make a lot more money. And every single time I'm actually pushing for higher quality or redoing something or striving You're for taking higher quality, money from yourself. I am losing money. 
and there's no increased upside, I'm only increasing my downside when I continue to push for uh, higher quality. But like, I can think anything I, I I can think as highly of myself as I like, and I know how that would work out. I know that I would I would end up settling for an inferior product, a product that wouldn't be as good as I could have made it. So anyway, that, I think that's kind of how it's going. So all that to say, Fablements, yeah, you might have to you might have to actually spend date night money. Um, but that's Brian staff, Swal- that was Brian swallowing for emphasis. Sorry, right there. <laughs> Gurg- gurgle, just gurgle. <laughs> you might have to spend date night money, but it is a date night. So pay up, buddy. Yeah, the SAS <laughs> lamp doesn't come free. Actually, it does. It comes free to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't. We are, speaking of not making money. Yeah, exactly. One of the reasons why this podcast is so high quality is the fact that, <laughs> is the fact that we make more if it's high quality. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- this re- th- this remains the question as we do this. We we're doing this by momentum at this point, right? I don't know that we're it's clear. Habit. I don't know that we're clear on why we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm clear. You're the one wondering. Brian, Brian's clear. <laughs> Occasionally, I have an existential crisis when yep. it comes to podcasting. Isn't a hundred episodes enough? Right. Can't we just recycle them? And uh, Brian yeah. says no. So here we are. <laughs> here we are. SAS. Yeah. Number uh, one hundred two. One hundred and two. Uh, the question we have following up, I saw this tweet lighting Twitter on fire shortly after we discussed Noah, but it said uh, this when Noah was drunk, lying naked in his tent and mocked by his son, he displayed a type of Christ crucified. What do you think about that one? It's a typology question. Uh, and uh, it uh, especially because I don't we, like it, Sam. I am. Yeah. Why not? Well, I think I think it's trying I think it's trying to say, <laughs> yes, we got one. <laughs> we got a we got a groan out of it. But we specifically said that Noah is a type of Christ. It yep. needs to be read that way. Yep. So, uh, what's the funny business going on with that tweet? I don't remember who said it, by the way. So, I just so saw we don't it. know so, who who I'm so, sighing about. Yeah. Um, when people start getting into ty- typology, they they sometimes have trouble finding the breaks. Okay. So. When you really, when you look at similes and metaphors, and and you look at the connectivity of all reality from a one common creator, and the fact that it's all unified art and all this kind of stuff, the fact that Noah is a type of Christ, yes, like in Noah, the world was saved. Yeah, you know, the world was taken into death, into a baptism, brought out the other side, and a resurrection. Yes, all these things. Yes, but the fact that Noah was imaging Christ in aspects of his the architecture of his story does not mean that he's imaging christ in everything so is he he being humiliated as christ was humiliated on the cross yes does that mean that he's being a a type of sacrifice in that act in having had too much wine and gotten drunk and made a fool of himself no like that like that particular part of the narrative it's like that no that's not uh, yeah. And even though I can say he'd been through a lot, <laughs> right? He'd been through a lot. He was coping with some, some issues, some inner trauma. <laughs> like he'd, he'd, he'd had some issues, but, uh, that moment is not a moment that we can look at and say, see, he's being like Christ there. Cause no, he's not, he's not being like Christ there. Right. And as soon as you dig into the specifics, obviously there are some, some pretty big differences. I think when we're talking this tweet is being a bit sneaky because it gets away with implying by connotation what it's not quite saying in denotation. You know that that Noah's life is like the is yeah. is a type of life of Christ. Yeah, sure. We've got plenty of Bible verses telling us to read Noah's life and the coming of the ark like the second coming. I think that's in Matthew and first yeah. and second Peter. But then to make it imply that the humiliation and badness or perhaps Noah's humiliation self-inflicted humiliation is similar to Christ is what the connotation is doing. Yep. But I think if you tried to pin this down, it'd be that tomato seed yep. with the, the fork. The, yeah, you're squirting a tomato seed around your plate with a fork. But it's the the issue here is that when a character uh, reflects Christ or, or images God, as we all should, every single one of us mm-hmm. like is called to be a type of Christ. So... Are there days when we're succeeding? Sure. Are there moments when we're succeeding? Yes. Are we always succeeding? If I succeeded in an overarching picture of my life and somebody's yeah. writing my life story and like, wow, he was really being, he's really, he's a picture of Christ here. He's a type right. of Christ. 
okay, well then when I'm misbehaving, am I also <laughs> like, right. no, that doesn't. My, my marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. Yeah. Therefore, when my wife and I fight, it's, it's like that. It's you like, know, it's like, and it's, that's just silly. Basically the, the typology train loses its brakes pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it really does kind of struggle and, uh, you have to, you have to know restraint and really find those, those places where the truth lies. So, my my favorite aspect of typology in the flood, the and also okay here's one more thing here, um, when you're dealing with typology, you want to try to find something that awakens you to new truth or new realization about how you should then go act. Okay, and you still you still so want that's to, the break. It's the, like I, I would say the tether. You, you, you don't you're not looking for arcane details that mean nothing. Mm. So, the typology of the flood that is the most interesting to me is, yeah, okay, here's this ark, here's this, you know, this salvation, this seed came back. Uh, I think I think that right there, that's more Israel. A chosen people set aside, mm -hmm. like cut off from the outside and, and kept unto themselves. The thing that's so interesting is that the, in the new covenant, we are not those people. We are the flood. Like, interesting. Like we're the water. And you see the reversal in you mean all because we're Gentiles here, or you mean the Christian no, church? No, yeah, what well, the Christian church, yes, but the Great Commission, we are the water. We're like we're Ezekiel. Like, you look at the visions. You look at the, oh, you know, the promises. The water, the water pouring out from under the temple. The water covering, uh, the waters covering the sea. Like the knowledge, of, hmm. you know, it's like all all it's the waters, the waters, the waters. And then you also look at the nature of Israel itself, Israel the people, and the way they were told to keep themselves pure, the things that would make them unclean, the different things that would taint you and then you look at the the same imagery that christ and others are using in the new testament and things like the, in passover you had to get all yeast out of the house no yeast out of the house and then for christ to say be the yeast mm -hmm. is a is an amazing flip and so the i i believe that the transition from old covenant to new covenant the transition of god's people under the old covenant to god's people under the new is the transition from being in the ark to being the flood mm -hmm. like no longer be the people in the boat. No longer be uh, this this group protected and set aside. Be the waters that cover the whole earth. Like be this death, this death, but this death into new life, this baptism, which is death. Be this baptism for the whole world. Hmm. You know that will that will lead them all to Easter. And that's I think that when you start to play with that typology and you look at that and you unpack the different details through Scripture. And you start looking at the way, uh, you know, the children of one believer in the new covenant are, are clean, they're holy, they're set apart. You look at you look at all of this, it flips. So now the whole now holiness is the pollutant. Right. Now holiness is it's the, the flood. contagious thing. Instead of keep yourself holy, keep yourself set apart, keep yourself pure, no yeast, no none none of that stuff. It's all very very different. And so um, that big movement, that big that flip is something that you discover, or at least that I discovered through looking at the typology of Noah and the flood, like in realizing like in what ways, what is this like? Like, what is the ark like? What is it? It's like, what's a set aside people. It's a chosen people like preserved and, and kept holy. And how does that change and how does that shift? And, okay. and even the baptism that we're all supposed to go through and then the pictures, the visions of the waters and all that kind of stuff that we see later, uh, unpack that for me. It made me think differently about how I am and how I am to be and how our community should be. And it, it becomes very, very practical when you discover typological truth. There are typological moments where you say, oh, that's a tidbit interesting. And to those things, I say, so what? Mm. Like, okay, it may or may not be true and there's no stakes whatsoever. So you're, if it's true, it means nothing Noah to my humiliated. life. Noah, Noah humiliated is like Christ humiliated. You, you're not seeing. Sure. I, I can look at that and say Noah was humiliated. Christ was humiliated in as much as they were both humiliated. They're similar. Mm -hmm. There's a similarity there. They both were shamed. Right. Now, um, Noah's shame was because he planted a vineyard and he got drunk. Christ's shame was because he was paying for sins, including Noah's when he got drunk. So, <laughs> you know, it's. There's similarities. And so when we're talking about similarities, that doesn't mean we found typology, typological similarity, which is more architecture, like the similarity of architecture, the similarity of significant movement, that, that kind of thing. So I I look at that. I look at the flood. 
And I, I'm not just trying to find all the ways in which Noah was Christ-like. I'm trying to find the where I fit. I'm trying to find the meaning for now mm. in the in the typology. Yeah, and Matthew, he talks about, hey, just like they were eating and drinking in the days of Noah when the flood came, yep. so they'll be eating and drinking in the days yeah. of the Son of Man. And I think it does. It is important to have it, a, you know, a somewhat reading of that affecting Jesus's own time mm-hmm. um, in order for that to make sense. Yeah. Because otherwise we do have this idea of, um, yeah, we're just supposed to hang on, find the ark. Yeah. Because the because the water's coming in, and we want to make sure we're not dead outside the ark. That's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't connected the so the but that the that water flip, flip that flip typologically is a, a flip of covenant, a flip of um, what we're here for. Yeah. You know, we are supposed to. And I've signed uh, when I when I in the time of Noah that little picture book I have of Canon. Right. When I've signed that for kids over the years, I've I've frequently written it in it on the title page. I write "Be the Flood" and and mm. sign it. It's like that's what we're supposed to be. And I think that this is even a, a giant uh, picture of strategy right now. Are you going to pursue the Benedict option? Is it a time to? Is this a time to get in the ark? Yeah. It's like, well, maybe so <laughs> like a time to oyster. Up. It's a, it can it can at least be yeah. It can it's at least a time to maybe get inside of walls, you know, like to to understand what you're doing. But even then, it should only be that so that you can then pursue your true calling, which is being the flood. Mm. Like that's it would only be a temporary thing because that's what we are supposed to be is the Great Commission, the waters covering the whole earth, and so on. So. Okay. Brian's the publisher of the book that I write that on the title page of, and he's never paid attention. And I'm a little bit hurt. I don't think I've ever gotten you to sign one for me or my children. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to change it. <clears throat> okay. Second part of the pod is a choose your own adventure. Oh, great. Do you want to talk about the WEF, the W E F? It's a, this is kind of a, this is an extension and actually collect connects with pre mills. Or do you want to talk about mm, people who, uh, People who do things that might get them killed, mountain climbers, adrenaline oh. chasers, um, thrill thrill seekers. Both these, are these are be interesting great. choices. This now is... they're very different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are very different. When do we talk about fablemans? Well, we can talk about fablemans next week. When do we? When are we supposed to have talked about fablemans? By the end of February. So this is the beginning of February. I don't even now. know when people uh, hear our podcast on delay. So they they all heard it last week of the first announcement of the fablemans. No wait. Okay. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Yeah. That's so they've had they've they they're gonna have a good long time to watch the fablemans. So it's, I thought we were gonna be announcing our like we're gonna start discussing it and then announce our next film. How, how does this work? Toward, they send their questions in. They watch it. They send their questions in from yeah. the conversation. Yeah. Are we one week out or two weeks out from discussing it? Two weeks out from discussing. So if we're two weeks out from discussing it, and then, okay, I'm very confused. We can cut all this conversation for our listeners. No, so. I think they'll enjoy it. <laughs> so Because it's February. It yeah, is now so, February 3rd. So here's the thing. If they if they heard this two weeks ago, and I don't know what the delay is, when will, when would they hear our discussion and announcement of the next one? We need to have that synced up so it's every four weeks. Right, right. Yep. But this first one, since we announced it in the middle of January, we'll have a six week gap. That's where okay, we're yeah, getting yeah, confused. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. Because we didn't do January. We just started in February. And also all suggestions for movie number two are completely welcome. Anybody should yeah. send those in. Yeah, definitely. Although everybody seems obsessed with music and musicals and storytelling through music. So blah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> no insult to the musicians out there, but I, I can't talk about that. <laughs> that, that is funny. Um, um I, I do have some great musicals to pitch that I maybe shouldn't on this podcast, but. Oh, no. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot that one. <laughs> that's the only story I think should be told through music that I know of. Yeah. That's it. Um, we'll save that for when we need to be canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so, as Nate, far as. Nate, far Nate as, has a fertile imagination. As far as, far as what we are going to be is discussing. It is the flood, Nate's yeah. imagination. <laughs> <laughs> some of us are going to want to not be in the flood <laughs> when nate's imagination uh, oh yeah yeah great perfect brian way to set it out um what so, i yeah. would, what i would say now we're talking about uh adrenaline junkies or what was the other one the the wf ai their desire to control the world and whether as larry taunton says they're actually you know the worst challenge to all of us right now the davos folks Hmm. I mean, I got lots of interesting facts about their their robot dogs and yeah. their desire to reduce 
population from eight to two. And I mean, that's that's more a question of like, what does that matter to us? And how dangerous do you think the WF is? I don't know. When I, I, when I watch the robot dog videos, I, I, I immediately think, I hope somebody's developing some really good jacket, jacketed rounds that can penetrate every aspect of those things. Oh, see, like, I go Ocean's Eleven EMP, self like hmm. an EMP. Yeah, that just shuts the yeah. dog down and the dog. No, that, that would also that would also be wise. Um, yeah, we definitely need to be developing techniques to destroy those things. Yeah, right now. Yeah, uh, and that's as far as I would go. It's just that everybody should have something in their house that they could use to destroy a robot. Yeah, um, hand deployed EMPs are not yet <laughs> are not yet common. Perhaps the jacketed round is a better a better move for right now. It's uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. But the robot revolution is here. It's going to happen five to 10 years from now. Uh, yeah. Larry Taunton was in Switzerland and he'd apparently talked to some WEF AI inventor, yeah. right? Who was talking about how they're creating the robots that pursue the humans and will never miss, right? That's that's kind of their thing. And he he got himself very worked up into you know, their desire to reduce population and their satanic ambition to save the planet. And I was all on board with yeah with with that sort of thing until he said something about this was all prophesied in revelation ah and I, all of a sudden i thought oh see i'm not afraid i'm not afraid in the same way uh as in this is the end times and the beast is arriving and uh so i don't know no. i don't know i'm i'm stalling as i text my daughter back who's in michigan um podcasting i say we'll call there, I'm now going to be held accountable. See if I did, in fact, actually call her back. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I honestly, I think that we're in for it on that side. But, yeah. but um, I think, I think uh, rednecks are up up to the task. I think in a in a war between the robots and the rednecks, the rednecks will win. That's I'm, just I can leave it there. The rednecks, they they gonna win. One of the rules we talk about in storytelling is wish fulfillment, right? And yeah. the rednecks versus robots is a major wish fulfillment. That would be a God answering all of the rednecks prayers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they're like, what we really want to have is a is a world war with robots. Right. They've been saying for a long in time. In the backwoods of Arkansas. I mean, they everybody has watched Will Smith and thought, Yeah. That looks pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. Um, we laugh, we laugh, but the thing is, we do have rednecks, and I really do believe they're ready. So I think they're ready, and they're up to the task. I've I've seen them hog hunting outside doors of helicopters. I feel like, yeah, this might be something that could be exactly what they were made for. The one thing I have seen it; those robots seem extremely expensive. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> true. They're not cheaply produced, right? And yeah. and the way it, also I may have said this before, but I'm not really scared until my phone never glitches and never fails. And I said that regarding like riding in a self driving car, like it's yeah. I don't want to just trust a self driving car. Um, and actually, I actually ordered a pickup truck this last year. It was supposed to be like a 2022, late 2022. Then it was a 2023, and it still hasn't showed up. And it's a GMC, and it's got their Super Cruise like self driving. And it just keeps not coming and they keep not, you know, they re are willing to return my deposit and all this other stuff as, and then it, it turns into a um, situation where they finally admit like, yeah, we just can't get the super cruise to work that we've advertised. And so we like, <gasps> we can mm. give you one without that, but we can't give you the one that we were advertising on the Super Bowl because we've not been able to make it work. So like, okay, I'm not saying that it won't ever work. Of course it will. You know, other, other yeah. people are already there, but I don't trust it. I don't trust it until tech doesn't glitch and tech always glitches. So yeah. although I guess a few developer friends have been stung by that view. They're like, well, that's we, the reason phones work is because the barrier is that we don't care if phones glitch because nothing goes wrong. But GMC, they say, look, they're yeah. not sending you your glitchy truck. <laughs> okay. When you look at the vaccine rollout. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, and I've, I've said this on the, on the podcast about ai the question is legal liability it is it is nothing else where will liability rest if legal liability rests on the part of on, on the side of the engineers and the designers and the manufacturers then uh we're we're in a much better place than if they successfully get uh immunity to that 
liability, like the pharmaceutical companies were all given. So when mm. Trump helped give the pharmaceutical companies all this immunity and they got to just pump out bilge water yeah. and get it legally mandated, that was like the jackpot of jackpots for them. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we could have happen now. So as far as phones go, like, yeah, okay, there's no consequences except for, yeah, there are. I mean, there's a, there's a ton of consequences. It's just that it's not life or death yeah. consequences usually. Yeah. Um, but anyway, all that to say is yeah. with the pharmaceutical rollout, it was life or death and that was pooched. So like what, yeah. what would make me think that. And the Pfizer stuff too. But the, yeah. The, the fact that. You know, the undercover video with them all talking about, hey, yeah, here are our story motivations. <laughs> yep. We are motivated to explore and then reap the benefits of having messed up. Yep. You know, that that stuff's very entertaining. Yep. I don't know. And, when and terrifying. So my, my point is like, oh, yeah, different industry. Sure, different industry. Still humans. Yeah. Still humanity. Still humanity pursuing power, uh, et cetera. So when we're rolling out self-driving, when we're rolling out AI, like the idea of it being glitch free, tech free is like, yeah. of course it's going to have glitches in techs, the, you know, tech problems. Sorry. Not yeah, the, Any kind of technical failure free, uh, who's responsible. As yeah. soon as we know that the answer to that question, I think we yeah. know a lot more about the future. I do think the kind of hysterical idea is both at, at once. And, and this is something that others have said, but, both at once expecting too much out of the technology. Like it's going to totally yep. transform the world. And also as opposed then, to just 10th grade English papers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Destroying 10th grade English. Right. That's, that's or more finally realistic. improving it. Yeah. Finally. Hey, we finally figured out how to get scores up in this, in this country. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I someone else sent me another article about how chat GPT can pass the law, the bar exam, right? It can do the questions and get a passing grade on the bar exam, um, which makes sense. I mean, it, I don't think anybody has said, why yeah. would it not be able to? That's right. Uh, th this, this bar question, or you do, everyone knows that's not what the exam is supposed to be, whether you'll be a good lawyer or not. It's yeah, the little barrier to jump into the club. So the one we really wanted to talk about that we didn't end up talking about the adrenaline junkie one. What, what about that? Are we supposed to cover? Well, I, I was curious. This is from you. <laughs> yeah. It is. You think you need to be more of an adrenaline junkie? Is that is that the <laughs> No. I watched the movies, you know, I watched the movies of the guys, Free Solo, The Alpinist, those kind of movies of guys doing sure. crazy things. And there's part of me that it, obviously is like I I wish I had the desire to go do that. But it also seems massively irresponsible. <laughs> 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 and so that that's that's the question. What how hard I do feel generally across the board, we need to push ourselves to be more ambitious. The idea, yeah. our failures are not usually the failures of having too much desire and too much drive. Yeah, it's too always, much aggression. and so then as much as I'm tempted to read the story, you know, of Rob Hall into thin air, Rob Hall getting stuck yeah. on Everest and getting one final phone call to his wife and kid before he dies, right yep. before the storm. Now you read that and think, man, you shouldn't have been up there. But at the same time, where's that line? Because it feels like, we could all do with wanting to be a little more like Rob Hall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It feels it's, like, a, it feels like a narrative question to me because yeah, it's like it that is. character. We like the one that goes for the Don wall free solo. Faster yeah. Than it, I think else. it kind of, there's, there's two aspects to this. There's uh aspect one. There's a narrative where there's a husband and let's say, for example, that he rides bowls. This is a man, he rides rodeo bulls. So mm -hmm. he's that guy. Yeah. Um, he's He's got a, let's say, a, an above average risk tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> Just... And and he's really, you know, he's got that bright smile and he's cheerful and he attacks it and, you know, yada, yada. And a girl falls in love with him. Like she falls in love with him. She catches his eye. She gets a ring on her finger. She marries him. What's the first thing she does in that narrative? Tries to get him to stop. Yep. Yeah. Why did she fall in love with him? Yeah. You know, it's, he's a bull rider. He's a bull rider. And I, I, this is a story that plays out over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you married the guy. Um, 
you're with you're with the guy you chase you chase this guy you were attracted to this guy why why were you attracted to this guy he's extremely driven yeah and highly competent and the the woman in this relationship tends to think and now you need to be about me now it needs to be about me not about your mission your calling or whatever now this is not to say that that nobody should ever stop riding rodeo balls you know it's like this is you know there's there's times change things change and and so on but that impetus to say you have to stop now that i've caught you you know now that i now that i've caught you you have to stop being you you have to stop being the person that i chased so if there's a you know a rock climber you know there's there's this you know somebody like free climbing crazy yeah, faces alex honnold and he's making stuff. money doing it this is like he's building a brand and he's got gear and he's like so he's building an empire and he's the most talented guy ever uh if i'm talking to him and i'm unpacking why he does it and what he wait, is he a junkie the odds are probably there's probably something he's probably addicted in some way to the sensation or the the conquest like yeah, i'll admit that like, but, but the, the, yeah but so yeah. are we all like is he yeah. like just like i might be addicted to sitting down by the fire <laughs> you know, it's like it's he could <laughs> he could be the toasty feeling yeah it's just it's so like, good just the you know coffee the right temperature and i've already built the fire and it's like everything's perfect um you know like that that kind of thing but he he's pursuing something he's built something if somebody he may he gets married somebody comes along he gets married and then she says i need you to stop being you now you know i, I need you to be subordinate to my worries and my fears and you know all that kind of stuff if he says babe i love you and i've got a massive insurance policy don't worry I'll take care of you even if, even if I'm dead. Mm. What do we think of that? Mm. That's not selfish. No, <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like it's yeah. It's kind of it's weird. We're like uh, you know, like it's yeah. odd. It's a it's an odd balance because it all comes down ad hoc. Like everything's ad hoc about every individual character who's doing it. Why yeah. are you doing it? Is yeah. it all about self gratification? Is it all about self interest? Are you are you taking these risks? entirely to chase your own high like and you and and you know forget all other relationships and forget all other people yeah. or alternatively is this what god made you for yeah free is this is this what you are made for and the thing is look at steph curry yeah he's not risking his life you know but he's obviously made for that <laughs> this is he's made to throw objects through through circles from a great distance like that's yeah. just like he's that he's that breed of dog even he's, while five other people try yeah, to stop even him. while people hang on to him he's doing this 82 games a year before the playoffs mm -hmm. he in order to do this it's 82 times a year like you look at his schedule and what that does to his relationship with his wife and his kids and and i i really like how he handles it and he's a super chipper guy but you think that that is not a light burden these are guys who have to regulate their bodies 24 7. these are guys sleeping in oxygen chambers to recover from the from the physical toll that's that's you know hammering their bodies playing with other athletes who are world class and just beating them up this often constantly so how many weeks you're in a year and you're doing this this yeah. many times and then you have the playoffs on top of that and you're traveling and you're living out of hotels and you're writing your hotel room number on your arm because you have no idea even which city you're in you're so turned around and you're just you're just going um and this happens with musicians yeah. you know where she fell in love with me because i was a country star but now I can't be what I, I don't know. Should I drive a UPS truck now because I'm married and I can't tour? Like what's, it's really difficult and it just straight up is difficult. Now imagine jump back to the uh, 1700s and some girl falls in love with a ship's captain. Yeah. I mean, it's like, okay. Yeah. You're going to be gone for. You're gone and you're at risk of death constantly. You know, even the cabin boy, the every, everybody in the crew, men have to be nuts. <laughs> they they have to. We we have to be a little bit nuts for civilization to do anything. Yeah. People got themselves into a wooden box and said, let's cross this ocean and see what's over there beyond the distance that anyone has ever survived. You know, like let's let's go do that. And we have no engine. 
what we do is we have these, you know, we have big cloths that we're going to try to like drag ourselves on the wind, <laughs> you know, across. It's insanity. Yeah. What they what they were doing. And we're so coddled that those guys who in another time would have been the ones voyaging. They they would have been the ones going. They would have been the ones, you know, finding new passages, new roads, you know, new locations for new cities, like sailing the seas. They would have been doing that, but we're in a place in our society where what is there for their masculinity, for their aggression to conquer. And so they they, you know, push it in all these different weird directions yeah. but you take those guys and move them back and they would be on whaling ships and and other yeah. things so get out of our like coddled moment in history and and realize that whatever principles that you distill for the behavior of a husband and a father right now would apply also 10 minutes ago and a hundred years ago and 200 years yeah. ago, the principles shouldn't change. Yeah. Then so can a husband go risk his life? Can a father risk his life with masculinity and aggression without it being uh, horrible for him to Selfish. jeopardize the yeah. fact that he might Selfish. be widowing his wife. He might be orphaning his children like that. Yeah. He's, he's taking that risk. Um, and I actually think that, this, this is a weird thing to say. This is an extra little twist. I was talking to a buddy about this. But men, we all we can all joke that men cannot multitask. Right? It's mm -hmm. we, we can't. Um, I think that's sort of by design so that we are willing to take massive risks and jeopardize ourselves in a moment because we actually are not capable of thinking about our our wives and children <laughs> like because we're just I know, I know what you're saying but we're only funny. like so if you if you are you know if you see a burning building you know it's like there's a burning building and somebody's screaming um, a man a real man capital m man reacts yeah he sees the situation he assesses the situation he takes action yeah, he if does you're immediately not, to go in your head and be like, his calculus is not has nothing to do with his wife or little Johnny back home that needs a dad. Yeah, it has nothing. It is only he's like men are one track minded. He's just looking at that. If he's running into a you know like a like a car wreck to try to get somebody out, somebody's stuck and the car's on fire and he's trying to get somebody out, he's not thinking if this explodes you know, little Leroy back home is going to be without a dad. He cannot think about that. Like, and I mean that literally, we can't, we are not <laughs> capable of thinking about it. Like this is to all our wives in that moment of heat, in yeah. that moment of stress and tension and aggression, there's a shooter in the mall, whatever it is, something horrible happens in that moment. Like a, a, a real masculine man acting is not thinking about you. He's not thinking about his wife. He's not thinking about his kids and he is incapable of doing so. And he should not. Gotcha. He's not made that way. And so this is not to say that free climbers and like, yes, yeah, the I mean, like, you know, I'm Everest climbers the, and all that kind of stuff. Leclerc, yeah. who's a, a crazy guy, you know, a yeah, crazy I'm not I'm like those. Yeah. It's not to say that there's no crazy people. There are tons of crazy people who are doing it for themselves, for the Instagram likes, they're doing it for a, a dopamine that's entirely narcissistic. So there's plenty of men who are adrenaline junkies and it's narcissism. It's not masculinity. That is out there. And so that kind of comes back to uh, what I was saying about being ad hoc. It's like case by case, every single individual before God has a, it's a different answer. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage wives out there who fell in love with their men because they were men fell in love with them because they really went for it do not be the unmaking of your man yeah like it's very easy it's very easy for that to be the case yeah honold's girlfriend in free solo is is her b story to the documentary is very interesting because that's what she's trying to deal with is yeah i fell in love with this guy i know i can't ask him to stop climbing because he'd leave me in a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I know, but I know where I fit. <laughs> yeah. She's like, I'm secondary to his climbing desire. Um, but at the same time, I still love this guy. I still very attracted to him. And the way that that works was, was I, I thought kind of interesting. Yeah. She's not, it, it, I, it, one thing I liked about that doc is how neither of them came across particularly likable. It felt very <laughs> real in that, in that moment, you could see them struggling with yep. the desire 
of this, you know, he does something that's extremely unique and is so focused, laser focused. And then as the story of his home life starts to come out and you start to see why he could be someone who's only happy on the side of a mountain, you, yeah. you kind of start to see some of that focus come. You're like, ah, yeah. yeah. And the narrative yeah. beats fall into place. Yep. Now, I think I think honestly that there there are so many men who they're living for their own pleasure and they're living, it's about them, right? Yeah. Um, and you shouldn't marry that guy anyway. Like if, if somebody is self-absorbed and narcissistic in their pursuits, yeah. prior to marriage, they still will be after. But it says that's really the only pressure. The pressure is um, if a guy's out there, is it possible for a single guy to be out there taking massive risks, uh, trying to conquer and, and mm -hmm. do these difficult things? Um, yes. Well, if so, then it's possible for a married guy too. It's not yeah um you know yeah. it's it's not always the it's not always the same if he's doing it for him as opposed to because this is what he's made to do and this is what he's called to do and he's got he's on some mission of some kind um yeah if he's doing it for him then it's a problem in any circumstances if that's just what yeah. he's doing and if he's not tommy, tommy don't try to break him tommy caldwell who is uh, he's the guy in donwall he's one of honald's friends but he's a dad who did scale back yeah. climbing as it happened and it is com comes up very much likable but he always says i can't be like alex you know he no. he's recognizing that there's a certain level he can be more well adjusted and the the fact mm -hmm. is that for guys um really well adjusted guys a huge part of their mission and their aggression is to build for their families yeah a lot a big part of their motivation is uh how do i how do i explain build legacy how do i build dynasty which means how do i build stuff to give to my kids how do i protect yeah. my wife and when they're driven like that they're mission driven like that they're still going to take risks that other people are not going to be comfortable with they're not just going to take they're not just going to be recreating in a very dangerous way right yeah you yeah. know it's they're trying they're trying to build they're trying to you know expand and not for just themselves they're trying to expand and build for their the next generation yeah and that is the ideal situation like that's the that's the setup but there is a ton of times when you know it's and I, we don't know anything right we know we know nothing about um tom brady and giselle their right. breakup right we know nothing about this other than the fact that he'd already ditched one wife to go with her but when she divorced him and it appeared to be connected to the fact that he wouldn't retire from football for one more season until he just retired again. Hmm. Um, like that, that's just super weird to me. And the fact the, is she could be absolutely right. The narrative questions are all, if there, you got, yeah. if you got inside the room, you could see yeah, you're totally right in your assessment of him. She could, she could be absolutely right. Odds are she's not odds are that there's actually, they're both wrong. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> um, yeah, but it's it, that story is told over and over and over again. And it happens with, not just with physical danger, but with husbands trying to build for the family or taking risks for the family or wanting to take vacations with the family and it stresses out. Like being more comfortable with stress and risk and 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 that kind of thing. So it gets all over, it goes all over the place. But if you're just talking about adrenaline junkies, people being super masculine and going for it, it well, if it's out of a narcissistic drive, then it's always bad in any circumstances. Doesn't and, matter how yeah. adrenaline filled it is. Yeah, and if it's not, <laughs> you know, if it's... um a, a little bit more of uh, I think chariots of fire, you know, feeling God's pleasure when you run, you know, if if you're in that zone, then it's great and you shouldn't stop until God makes you, and He will. <laughs> yep, yep. There we go. That's sass, sass, f f sassafras. Um, so basically, taking away people should watch Fablemans. They should pay full freight. And they should get us there. Oh, and have we have movie parties. So like we get do your have a mailing together. list if you want to Watch stay up to date. We've got yeah. a mailing list even now. Nice. So. Well, chip chip in. If you're going to be in LAMP, like pull your funds. Watch Fablemans. Send um, the questions. Send the, send the questions and we'll, we'll, have, uh, we'll have a chat. We'll see if we can have a cheaper film next time. For all you, you know. And you're going to got to average out your LAMP expenses across the year. And it's going to be negative. <laughs> I love it. Peace. Hi, it's Brian Cole here, wanting to let you know how you can support the Stories Our Soul Food podcast. You can do that by checking out Canon Plus. Head over to mycanonplus.com. Thanks for taking the time to listen to the Sassf. 
podcast. We'll hopefully be seeing you at mycanonplus.com.